Today I'm speaking with Richard Brennan and Richard lives in Galway in Ireland and uh, he's the director of the Alexander Teacher Training College Ireland. Hello Richard. Hi Sue. I, I wondered if, uh, well thanks, thanks for speaking to us today and um, I just wondered if you'd like to tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, sure. Uh, I've been an Alexander teacher for over 30 years and the way I got into it because I had chronic back problems and most of the chronic back problems were caused by I used to teach people to drive and I was sitting down in a car seat all day every day for about eight or nine hours. And then after a few years I started to develop a, a really bad back and then I tried many many different things and Alexander's technique was the only thing that made any sense to me at all. All the exercises that physios give you and all the chiropractor manipulation was helpful for maybe a day or two but not long term. So uh, that, that's what I got me interested in it and then I trained to be a teacher so I could help people with the same problem that I had. And then I realized that uh, most of the problems during my Alexander lessons uh, myself a lot of the problems came from the backwards slope of the car and that's what got me interested in, in uh, 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 school seating because I have four children and I noticed the same thing happening with them. I have to just say that that quote from Alexander you know actually he he may have said that but he said it when before the invention of the black plastic stacking chair Exactly, yeah, exactly. And you know, I don't know about you, but when I went to school, this reveals my age, the benches were completely flat and the desks were sloping forward. It's a completely different scenario. And you know, I, I um, actually I was um, born around the same time Alexander died. So, yes, he didn't have any experience of uh, uh, how bad the furniture had got. I think, I think if he'd been living now, he would have uh, he would have had some sympathy, okay. So I think if you're going to teach someone how to sit properly, if they can have the best conditions for that to take place without having to fight something that's actually bad for you. Yeah, so. I totally agree. I mean, when you see children in primary schools, uh, especially the youngest ones, they are really struggling to sit with good use in terrible chairs and it's it's completely obvious that the fact yeah. that the chair is a too big but b is so badly designed that it's really impossible to do anything other than slump backwards and you know they can't support themselves yeah. with their feet so it's a really impossible situation for a child mm -hmm. yeah no it is it is and and the solution is so simple that that's what's so maddening about the whole thing uh, they could just say that government can make legislation that if when schools have to replace the chairs not they don't actually replace the chairs anyway, but when they have to need new chairs that they uh, ha have a look at what they're replacing it with and they don't replace it with the backward slope yeah it, really it just wouldn't cost anyone any money wouldn't cost anyone any money that's absolutely true and I remember I, when I worked in uh, for a while in um, a state primary school about in the, in, the, in the early 90s and that's exactly what happened Richard because they, they, they believed me when I said about how badly the chairs were designed and they needed to order new furniture so they ordered stools and um, they weren't perfect but they were a lot better. <laughs> So, and, mm -hmm. and it didn't cost any extra or any different. It's really, you know, it's a question of the yeah. understanding, isn't it? Yeah, it's, 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 it's education. Yeah. People need to be educated why the chairs are not good. And then when I went to, uh, became a teacher, I was living in Totnes and there were 30 other teachers in there. And it's only a town, very small town of 30, uh, sorry, of 8,000 people. And so I started doing edu education classes and they used to come up to me at the end and say, I'm really interested in, can you uh, advise a good book? And at the time there was only Chris Stevens and Michael Gale's book out. 
apart from Alexander books. And when I lent them one of the books, they came back to me uh, after a week and said, no, 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 this is far too complicated. I don't understand a word of it. So I realized there was a gap in the market of Alexander books taking people right from the basic who didn't know anything at all. So that's what got me interested in, in writing to, again, help people um, who had the same condition as I had. And now I've written eight books. I suppose the most appropriate one for people interested in the subject is change your posture, change your life, because it goes into the whole issue of how it starts. And, you know, we have really nice posture when we're, when we're young and that deteriorates very, very quickly. Yeah, I have to say that I've noticed over the years, a lot of pupils have come to me on the back of reading one of your books. Um, mm. That one and the workbook that you wrote uh, as well are the two I think that people mention. You know, and I usually say, How, have you read any books? Have you? And, and, and often that's what's got them interested in the first place. Yeah, well, that was my hope. It wasn't to teach the te technique uh, through a book. It was to get people interested so they would go away and find a, a lesson or a practitioner, or a teacher, or a course, or something. Yeah, well, I think that's definitely, that's definitely the case. So um, I think it'd be nice if we talk now a bit about the, your work relating to the school chairs campaign. And sure. so, um, because there may be some people who don't know about that, and also perhaps, you know, don't really understand what has Alexander Technique got to do with school furniture. So do you yeah. want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Well, it's, uh, I guess, the, the, the quotation that I keep getting thrown at me by Alexander teachers. I think Alexander once said, you should be able to sit in any chair with good posture if you knew how. And, and, I, and I do agree with that. But you're not going to get every single child in the UK and Ireland and throughout the world having Alexander lessons. And I think... Um, just on the whole, if we're looking at, at uh, the reasons why things happen, Alexander wanted to know why, why he lost his voice. And I was interested to know why I had a back, backache. Because on, the, on one of my lessons, uh, the Alexander teacher took me to my driving instructor car and he changed the angle of the chair. And I immediately felt more relief in the back. Okay, so I think uh, the the chair do are a big um, a big reason why children lose this lovely posture, and it's not just me saying it. The Department of Education uh, or the National Back Pain Association, back in two thousand and four, said that school chairs were the major cause of lower back problems in adults. Okay, there was a report out. That's nearly 20 years ago and nothing, not much has actually happened since. So it's very slow progress, but there, there is progress. So Richard, what, what is the actual problem with the current design of school furniture? Okay, well the actual problem is up until recently, most of the chairs had to go backwards by at least five degrees. Now, if you look at the anatomy of a uh, skeleton, you can see that what people sit on is the uh, sitting bone, which is a part of the pelvis, and it's completely rounded. So when you put something rounded on a, on a slope that goes backwards, if you put a ball on a chair, it would roll backwards. And the same thing happened to the pelvis. So the, the pelvis is rolling backwards, and then the teacher comes in and asks the child to write at their desk. So you can't roll up a hill, or it's very difficult for you to roll up a hill. So what happens is the pelvis is rolling backwards. So the only way that the child can actually reach the school desk to write on the piece of paper is to bend their back. Okay. This is a typical, typical child at a school desk writing. And you can okay. see the whole bend is in the upper back. And children don't like the feeling of this posture becoming more uh, condensed or, or more rounded. And they do their best to uh, try to sit on the chair with more poise and the first thing they do is they, they tilt forward on the toe front legs of the chair. So you can see how, how, how the tilt is 
it's actually uh, probably about 10 or 15 degrees of tilt. It's, it's not just a small tilt. It's not like they get the chair flat. They tilt about 15 degrees forward. They keep the back straight and then they can reach the, um, they can reach the desk no problem at all. They're not allowed to lean forward. Uh, the the, the uh, reason that's giving is you'll break the chair, but actually the, there's a more um, important reason somebody can trip over the back legs of the chair, probably the teacher. So they're told not to do that. And then what they do is they sit on a leg because they're trying to fill this gap. So when you sit on a leg, it raises the pelvis up and you can rock on your leg backwards and forwards. It's not good for the circulation though, so they get told not to do that. So they're just left in this kind of, they're called bucket seats. The whole pelvis is actually in this bucket, but it's actually rolling backwards and then it puts a lot of problems when they try to get to the school books. There's a wooden one which is just a slope backwards and the plastic ones which is more of a bucket, they're called bucket seats. Then uh, what happens is the bend in the back becomes a habit. The children do it even when they're not over a school desk. So this becomes a bigger problem as they get older. We're, we're at school 15,000 hours, you know, between the age of five and the age of 16. 15,000 hours, that's not including homework. So 15,000 hours of doing something over and over and over again forms a habit. And this is what we're talking about with Alexander Tentley. We're talking about the formation and the eradication of harmful habits. This bending over the top of the back is, is a harmful habit. This is a child of about eight or nine. And all he's doing is he's sitting on a beach, texting his friends probably. And you can see that the head is way forward of the spine. And the head is the heaviest bit of the spine. So even on a child's head, which is much less weight than an adult's head, it's still pretty heavy in comparison to the rest of the body. And then what that does is it starts to push all the discs out of place. And those discs are pushed onto nerves. And that, that child there is a, uh, a disaster waiting to happen. Now at that age, you can do something about it very easily. You can teach him to be more aware. You can teach him to text in a different way. But by the time we get to adulthood, we've done it so many times, it takes quite a long time to get out of the habit. And if you compare the picture of the child texting on the beach at the age of eight and the child sitting on the beach at the age of one, it's a completely different shape. And then they do that so many times that by the time they're teenagers, they sit like picture number four. And if you look at the picture very carefully, you can see that the reason she's sitting like that is a bend in the top of the spine. The head and the spine are not in alignment. And this forward tilt of the head causes a lot of tension in the neck. It causes the muscles to be over contracted for a long period of time. And eventually by the time they're 30 or 40, they have chronic neck problems, chronic shoulder problems or bad back. We're talking about in our society, 49% of the adult population suffer from backache in any given year. That's, that's quite an academic. The problem does start at school. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. So Richard, uh, what can be done to rectify this problem? Well, the two ways to do it is we can educate the chair manufacturers to make uh, different chairs. I, uh, I had this guy come into me from, uh, he was on a, um, a course, a design course, designing furniture. His name is Simon Denneby, and he came to me and I, I went through all this and then he started a company in Dublin and now he designs very good school furniture. They're very flat and as a child leaned forward to the school books, it, uh, the, the front of the seat gives way. So it allows the child to move very freely and he calls the uh, company Perch. Uh, there are other company, um, but they're very small and they're very few and far between. People are going to want to know what I can do about it now without having to go and buy an expensive chair. And it's very simple. If, if you can put a wedge shape cushion on the existing chair, a lot of the problems uh, go away. I, I would say there's two problems. One is the desk is flat, where it used to be sloping forward. And the other is the chair is going back when it used to be flat. It's the same child as in picture eight, but now all we give would give her a wedge and we gave her a, a kind of 
uh, a desk that was actually slanting. There was no Alexander directions or anything like that. She just sits up, sit, sitting in a different way. And that child, well, that child is my child, actually. So I know she, she was nine years old at the time. When I went into the school, I said to the teacher, could I use a cushion right from the word go, right from the age of five? And the teacher said, uh, well, I'd have to ask the principal. So the principal called me into the, the office and said, why, why do you want to use a cushion? Uh, he was just interested. I told him why. He ordered a cushion for every child in the school. And then after about a year, he said, I am so amazed that their, their posture is so much better than, than it was a year ago. But he gave the child an option of using it or not using it. They didn't have to use it. Every single chair, every single child used the cushion from their own volition, from their own choice. That's, they were, that's, more, comfortable. They that's were more comfortable on it, yeah. That's amazing. As yeah. simple as that. And where can we get these cushions? Can, you know, are they easy to come by? Okay. Well, uh, a lot of places have them. Uh, a lot of supermarkets have them. Little Aldi, uh, but quite often the cushion that they make are too soft. So when people sit on them, they go to practically nothing. So you have to find a cushion that actually um, it's 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 quite quite firm when you sit on them. Uh, I couldn't find anywhere in in uh, Ireland, so I I started producing my own. Uh, and, I, and I tell them, but there are other manufacturers there. So when before you buy one, you have to check the density of the of the cushion, and the density of the cushion should be around about eight pound chip foam. It's called eight pound chip foam. It's it's a load of chip foam chipping made with glue and all put together, and it makes quite hard foam. The, the wedges uh, um, have to be and they have to be firm. And you're trying to make the chair from a backward tilt of about five degrees to a forward tilt of about five degrees. So the cushion needs to be at about 10 degrees. I'm wondering, Richard, if you've got a cushion there that you could show us. It's, it's just like this. It's, a, it's just a wedge. And uh, they, they're, they're fine for children from the age of nine upwards. Uh, but the uh, smaller children need a, a smaller cushion. This is actually a child's cushion. Uh, I think I I don't know anyone else who makes them. I actually make them because I had such a a lot of uh, parents came to me and said the cushion is too big for my child's uh, chair at school. So I actually started making smaller ones. So they should be two two sided, one for children under nine and one for children nine and over. And can and can people order them from your website? Yeah, they are. They're, 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 they're available on the website. If, if you're a teacher and you want to know the experience of, of a wedge before you buy one, it's very simple. All you do is you get a couple of uh, two inch books and you put them underneath the back legs of a chair. And that turns any chair that's sloping backwards into a flat or forward tilting chair. And you can adjust the book to whatever you you feel comfortable with so people can have the experience of what it's like sitting on a improved chair without spending one penny you can't redo really it for children because they're moving around all the time and it, it's a danger so if you were in the school you would have to get away not just uh, put something underneath the back legs it's too dangerous so how did you first discover the um the link to poor posture um and school chairs okay uh i just want to, to maybe talk about the word posture because there's a lot of talk in the alexander world that they hate the word and alexander didn't like it uh, the way i use the word posture is uh, uh the way i actually use myself but people the the general public don't really understand the words how i use myself it doesn't mean anything to them but they do understand the word posture. Now they think of posture as a fixed position. I think of posture as something movable, okay? In fact, the dictionary definition of the word posture when I finished my training was the relationship of one part of the body to, to the rest. And that relationship, if, it, if it's free, it's good posture. If it's fixed, it's bad posture. So someone can be sitting very straight in a fixed way, and I would say that it's bad posture. I'm not talking about shape. 
I'm talking about flexibility and, and movement and balance and alignment. Okay, so the, the word posture for me is, is more far reaching than for most people. Um, the, the way I discovered uh, my back problem uh, and what was the cause of it is by an Alexander teacher who actually changed, he put two blocks of wood underneath my driving seat when I was teaching people to drive. And from not being able to work, I was then able to drive. It was more comfortable. So I realized after a while that part of my problem with my back problem was not me, it was the actual seat I've been sitting on. So car seats, this is talking about the late 70s, early 80s. The car seats used to be going back probably as much, if not more than they are now. And I realized after, after this lesson that there was a correlation between the seat I was sitting on and my back problem. So then I changed all my chairs, you know, car seats and at home to more to a flatter chair and my back, my back got uh, much better because of it. Then when my children, I had young children at the time, I realized that the same problem was happening with them. And that's why they were all slumping over their school books. So the more I learned about the early dancing, the more I realized that this was going throughout the whole society. Uh, and then I just began to notice uh, chairs in pubs and cafes and everywhere. Uh, they were all, they were all um, basically the same designs. They, they're going back of the, of the seat. And I, I, I have a feeling it came from the car industry because in 1950s, all the, all the car seats were bench-like and in the 60s and 70s, they all became doubling backward because it's, the shape of the car changed and they got a more sloping windscreen and then they had to put the, the they had to put the person further back and the only way they could do that was but to lower the back of the seat to put, get them in so and then it just became a, a a fashion design so i think that's how it actually started and then, then i then i realized that my children were you know as i was getting more into the technique i could see my kids misusing themselves much more uh, as they got older. As you can see in, in picture number five, every single child is doing exactly the same thing. It's not an isolated problem. Everyone is bending at the very top of the back, they're bending their neck, they're bending their head, and they're doing it for long periods in a day. And this forms the actual habit of what we call pulling down in the front. The muscles in the front start pulling us down, so they actually shorten. And the only remedy that we're given in our society is sit up straight, shoulders back, head up. And when we do that, we basically tighten every single muscle in the body and that is a major cause of back problem because you're pulling the back in the whole time so back problems are just caused by all this uh, sitting and it doesn't it doesn't really um stop when you go leave school you go to our computers and we type and then what we have is in the mid 30s or 40s you can see that the shape of the back is completely rounded he's not over a desk he's not at his computer he's just looking out to see and you can actually see there's almost a deformity and all this is caused by a lot of sitting bending in the wrong place so i understand that you had a part uh, you played a part in um changing the specifications of school furniture uh, with the help of staff. Is that right, Richard? Uh, yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, uh, I've been um, noticing, I've been following the specifications of furniture and um, I've been to at the Department of Education in Ireland and they say, and they said, this is back in the um, maybe late uh, 1990s, that all school furniture had to slope back for five degrees. It seemed to me that the reason for that was the stackability of the chairs. So you can stack quite a lot of chairs if they're all sloping backwards a bit. It's a safety thing. So anyway, I was trying to describe to people that it wasn't a good idea. And then, I've, I don't know how I found out about it, but I found out there was a proposal in the uh, school standards but they were going to change it from minus five to minus 10. This would make it really much worse. So I, I contacted the, uh, the standards authority in Ireland 
uh, and I they got an interview with somebody there and they said well the best thing you can do if you really are passionate about it is join uh, as a volunteer so I joined the National Society uh, Standards Institute of Ireland and then there was a conference in Denmark in Copenhagen and they said why don't you go and explain to all these people who are all chair furniture designers what the problem is so they kind of sent me and they didn't fund me but actually stat funded me okay i asked that if they could uh, and they did so they, this was part funded by stat and i went there and i explained i took a skeleton with me or a spine i sat the spine on the chair i explained it and and a lot of, of the the chair designers started to realize that actually minus 10 was a bad idea so they changed the specification they didn't in, uh, um, change the minus five but what they did is they uh, they allowed plus eight so now a chair can be either minus five but it also can be plus eight so you can have a chair that's actually sloping forward now if, if the if the headmaster wanted to buy one it would be in the standards okay so it, yeah i was very pleased by that and then the person i was talking about earlier simon Denneby from uh, perch he, he came with me because he he was a chair designer so he knew the technical details so uh, he came with me and he also was a part of changing the the specifications and now as far as i know uh, a headmaster can uh, order chairs anything from minus five which is not a good idea to plus eight if they want to that's absolutely fantastic mm -hmm. yeah i'm very pleased about it yeah oh, fun. I, mean, I didn't yeah. actually didn't know that it's amazing yeah 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 it just yeah. goes to show doesn't it we can make a difference yeah we took, it took about 20 years but yeah <laughs> yeah yeah can you tell me a little bit about the um cladder school research yeah um well first of all one of my pupils was the uh deputy headmistress of the cladder school so she had a connection with him and then when i was organizing the the congress in limerick in 2015 uh one of the people i really wanted to get was galen kranz who wrote the the book the chair because I, I really like her work and I really agree with what she was saying. So she came along and she gave a very good uh, presentation and a lot of my students on the training course were at the, uh, the Congress. So afterwards, after the Congress, they came back and they said, look, we, we, we need to do something about it. So they got together with the, the ex-headmistress who was now a teacher, Kathy Dibney, and she got, them in to see the headmaster at the Cladder School. So me and a, a whole group of um, either graduates or, or trainees, we went into the school, we explained what the whole thing was about. And he said, well, why don't you come in and do, we'll do a pilot study? And that's what we did. So uh, in, this was in, I think, November 2015, so we're just after the Congress, to June 2016, we came in and we explained to the children about using the wedges and uh and and then we went away we went away for six months and we came back and we got the uh we got the report uh what we noticed first of all is the teacher said when we were coming back in to ask the children how they got on the children did not want us to come back okay and we said why he said because they were afraid you were going to take the wedges away okay so we got comments like i feel much comfortable my back no longer hurts these were children of about eight or nine who had the wedges for six months and then they were so attached to them the school had to let them use the wedges in the class when they moved out of the class so they had them to the rest of the school okay but the head, the, the teacher who had knew nothing about the Alexander technique and nothing about furniture, he was totally impressed with it. He said the children are, are sitting much better. I'm not having to, uh, you know, give out to them about how they're sitting anymore. And he said the most noticeable is the teachers 
from other classes when they came in to teach my class, they were actually shocked because of the difference in their own class and my children. Wow. So, yeah, yeah, it made a real difference. And then the headmaster was so, he saw the report and he was so impressed. He said, uh, we want you to do another test. And this is like eight or nine years. And you want to put the chairs on the a class as they're just coming into school. And they will have them till the age of 13 or 14. Okay, or 12 and 13. So they're going to have them from the age of four to the age of 12. Wow, that's and, and then we're going to go back at the age of 14 and we're going to, and there's another class who didn't have the wedges and we're going to compare the difference. That's, so that's so ongoing. brilliant. I mean, that's absolutely brilliant. How mm -hmm. old are they now then? Uh, when did the project, that, that part of the project start? Um, well, we finished the one study in 2016 and I think it was the 2017 that the actual study started. So we're about three or four years into it. Wow. Wow. Now, have you been back to see how those kids are getting on? Yeah, yeah. We don't, we don't go back quite as often as the last time. We go back once a year just to talk to the teachers, talk to the students, make sure they're okay. And yeah, and, and now the school is talking about, it's quite a big school. It's 30 children in a class, and I think every year it's about two classes. So it's you know, quite a few hundred school, and they're gradually thinking about getting more and more wedges for, so everyone will have one. But very open-minded headmaster, yeah. That's and and it was interesting because when I first trained as an Alexander teacher, I was listening to Radio Four. This is nothing about Alexander, maybe. I was listening to Radio Four, and there was a headmaster talking, and he said he was he would said something quite profound. I really remember it very distinctly. He said, "When my children come into school on the first day." They are uh, bright, they are bright-eyed, they are open-minded, their posture is really great, and they're very, uh, their, their movements are, are, are very graceful. But when they leave school, they don't look at you anymore, they're always looking down, their posture is terrible, and they're not, they, they don't want to help you anymore. They're not helpful. And then he said, what in the name of education are we doing to our children? Wow. That wasn't me, that was a headmaster at a big school. And I just thought that was so profound. And it's a question that we need to ask ourselves, or the, the, the Department of Education needs to ask itself. What are we doing to the children? If they can come in, they're very straight, they're eager to learn, they're eager to please. And when they leave, they're not eager to learn or eager to please because you learn when you're when you're enthusiastic that's when you learn so it's it's a big this the school chair it's just a bigger how can you how can you work if you're bending over a school desk you're compressing the whole lungs you're stopping the oxygen getting to the brain you know it's it's not making sense because they need oxygen to the brain the more oxygen they get to the brain the quicker they're going to learn so it comes into everything it's very holistic, this issue. Oh, I totally agree with you. Yeah, I'm, that's brilliant. Really brilliant. So what can people do in the future to alleviate the back and neck problems that most children um, seem to suffer from? Okay, well, if your child is, is quite small, uh, you know, four or five or six, you can you can get them the wedge shape cushion and you can keep they can keep that lovely posture but by the time they're eight or nine they probably have lost it quite a lot and if you just give them a cushion they're probably going to be slouching on the cushion so they do need some guidance they do need some alexander lessons and and i, I if you can use a cushion and some alexander lessons you can stop these habits in an early stage if you're a teenager they're probably going to need more lessons, but it's the same thing. So, you know, I don't want any parents who are watching this video to think, oh my God, my, my, my child posture has been ruined and there's nothing I can do about it. Alexander, I had a major back problem. I wasn't, my posture was not good. Uh, I wore out the three bottom discs in my spine. They, they didn't exist anymore. The doctors wanted to operate and fuse the spine. And the only reason I didn't have the operation is because my father's a doctor and he said, don't do it because I see the people afterwards. 
as far as I know, all the all the vertebrae have reformed, all the all the discs have reformed, and I haven't had a day of backache for about 25 years. So I don't want people to worry that oh my God, my child pottery is ruined and there's nothing I can do about it. Alexander technique, uh, retraining the person. It's not education; it's re-education. You they can find that lovely posture again by releasing the tension in the body and the habits. So yeah, it, it just uh, explore the Alexander technique. That, that's my, you know, my advice really to anyone. And a lot of what you've just said is, I mean, is incredibly, it's just completely my experience as well, of working in primary schools and, you know, the work mm -hmm. that I've done. And, and, and that quote from that head teacher was very interesting because um, if you watch the, um, one of the Congress videos, uh, the conference videos, sorry, which is an interview with Liz Steinfeld from Educare Small School, she mm -hmm. talks about one of the reasons she wanted to start a school like that was was exactly mm -hmm. the scenario that you uh, you heard described by that head teacher on Radio Four. In fact, she almost says it word for word that they come in all bright eyed and you know enthusiastic, and then that just seems to get knocked out of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are we doing? Yeah. Well, Alexander did say. Uh, you, we teach children mathematics, we teach them English, we teach them all these subjects, but we don't teach them how to hold the pen. And we don't teach them how to sit at their desk. So I think, I think it, it comes under this umbrella. Okay, so thanks. Thank you, Richard, very, very much indeed for, for today and for, for giving your time and your expertise. It's been very, very, very interesting. Okay. You're very welcome to, very welcome. And just really now to say thanks and, and, and goodbye. Okay, okay, goodbye. Mm -hmm.